Welcome to Catalytic Leadership, the podcast designed to help leaders intentionally grow and thrive. Here is your host, author and leadership and executive coach, Dr. William Attaway. I'm so excited today to have Tyler Mount on the podcast as an industry-leading branding and digital strategy expert. Tyler has served as a branding and business consultant, a digital marketer, and a social strategist to nearly a 1,000 clients spanning 14 countries worldwide. As the owner of Henry Street Creative, a creative agency specializing in brand design, content creation, and web development for some of the most esteemed industry professionals, Tyler and his team have partnered with Ryan Serhant, Spencer Raskoff, the founder of Zillow, Picasso, John Laguerre, the CEO of T-Mobile, NBC, Nomira, Baccarat, One Hotel, and countless others. Tyler's career has been profiled in dozens of reputable publications, including the New York Times, Forbes Magazine, Medium, and Out Magazine. In addition to serving as a keynote speaker for marketing and real estate conferences across the country. His non-traditional direct approach empowers business owners to take control of their businesses and build empires. Tyler, I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited. I would love for you to share a little bit of your story with our listeners, Tyler, particularly around your journey and your development as a leader. How did you get started? Well, look, uh, I have a very non-traditional, non-linear path to where I am today, which actually I find is more common than you would think, right? No one, well, I don't want to say no one, the majority of people don't wake up in third grade and be like, I want to be a digital marketing agency (laughs) owner, right? Um, I didn't even know, you know, we didn't even know what Facebook was, um, you know, when, when we were growing up, but you know, I, I've always had a passion for people. I've always had a passion for helping people. And I've always had a creative instinct. Growing up, I loved the theater. I still love the theater. I was a theater major. I'm a Broadway fanatic. Um, I grew up in small town, Texas. I knew obviously that wasn't the place for me. So um, for college, I went to school for theater in Austin. And then right after graduation, I said, I'm going to pursue my dreams of working on Broadway. And I was very, very fortunate to be able to work on five Broadway shows as stage manager um, prior to like the age of 25. So I was really, really fortunate to have that experience in the Broadway community. Um, During that time, I really just had this urge to create content. Now, keep in mind, this was in 2014, which doesn't sound like that long ago, but this was before the word influencer even existed. I created, you know, a a content series that involved me and a Broadway star sitting on my couch in my living room drinking wine. um, And we would chat, we'd, we'd play a fun game. And ultimately that series changed my life because what started as a passion project really started to give me chops in what we now know as content creation and digital Mm. marketing. Mm. From there, that same series was acquired and picked up by Playbill, the leading Broadway legacy Mm -hmm. brand. And over the course of three years, I went from zero subscribers to that series being seen by a hundred, excuse me, being seen by a million people in 168 countries every single week. It changed my life and made me a common name and a very niche community. From there, I took those skills when I was offered a position at my dream role, which was at NBC Universal, heading up portions of their digital marketing strategy. But obviously, my goal was to stay relevant and to stay active in the Broadway community. So I was, through a weird series of events, graciously offered a position as a producer on Broadway. Having no experience, I was mentored by um, uh, a now colleague and friend, someone who changed my life, an uh, esteemed producer named Hunter Arnold and Kayla Greenspan. And, and they really helped me hone what it is to be a producer on Broadway. Again, strange wow. series of events. Um, that first show I did on Broadway won me my first Tony. The second show I did on Broadway won me my second Tony. The third show I did on Broadway 
won my third Tony and the fourth show <laughs> on Broadway got me my fourth nomination, which at the time made me the youngest producer in the history of Broadway to be nominated for all four major categories at the, at the award ceremony. Now, keep in mind, I'm doing that while I'm working in digital marketing where I really find my passion and hone my chops at, at NBC. And, and then I eventually transferred back to real estate development where I started my career. And, you know, during the height of COVID, multiple things in my career happened that led me to working and overseeing portions of the Biden-Harris campaign. Little did we know that he would obviously eventually become the leader of the free world. Um, and wow. as he transitioned to the White House, that's when I accidentally, again, started what is now known as Henry Street Creative, my digital marketing agency and consultancy firm. Obviously, when you come off a presidential campaign, it's much easier to you know get a client so that's when john ledger and i of t-mobile fame were connected he was my very first client a dear friend someone i i trust um and adore um and the rest is kind of history john turned into pharmaceutical companies turned into spencer raskoff of zillow fame turned in into linda yaccarino who is now the ceo of twitter aka x um, and almost a thousand clients later in terms of business consultancy, website development, branding, positioning, um, we are really focused on bringing a personal brand to everyone from new business owners to, of course, Fortune 100 CEOs. What a journey. Truly, <laughs> truly. And, and, and so non-traditional, but... I've rarely talked to a business owner who's like, I went to Harvard Business School because I knew I wanted to start this app I'm uh, I'm selling today. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, there's no such thing as a wasted experience. And I'm, I'm looking at all these different pieces in your journey. I would imagine that all of those stops, all of those elements that make up the, the stew that is you, all those elements have shaped your approach to digital marketing. I mean, certainly what, what's interesting is I went to school for acting. I have never professionally acted outside of college. And a lot of people would be like, well, that's a waste. We could play that game until yeah. we died. I could also yeah. argue that I wouldn't have had the experience I had in order to get the job on Broadway that led me to my content series, that led me to Playbill and the person at Playbill who connected me to NBC and the person at NBC who connected me back to real estate development. I met the person who brought me onto the Biden-Harris campaign from the theater, which would not have happened without my acting degree. Um, my managing director, a lot of the staff members that I have on staff either come from the theatrical world or are my friends from theater prior to starting the agency. So yes, although many people at face value could be like, well, let's say acting school was a wasted time or a wasted experience. I actually would argue I wouldn't have the success I have without that so-called wasted experience. I agree a hundred percent. You know, another thing that you seem to be a, just an amazing illustration of is the power of connections. You know, so often we, we make a connection with somebody not really thinking that that's going to lead to this one, which is going to lead to this one, which is going to lead to this one. But I, but I hear that story a lot. You seem to be like the poster child for this, like all the different connections now. I think you may be my new illustration for this particular point. The power of connections and how there's no such thing as a wasted connection either. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And I really would say that that's my inherent superpower. I love connection. I love getting to know people. I've never met a person that I can't talk to. I could talk to a wall. So, you know, <laughs> and it doesn't come from an ulterior motive. I genuinely yeah. love being around people. I'm so extroverted. And my personality and my genuine, what I like to believe, you know, desire to help people and show up for people, I think has really aided me in my journey and really is the basis of my philosophy for, philosophy for all of my clients. How can I, through digital marketing, help you create more relationships? Note, I didn't say sell more product. Yes. That's a natural byproduct of what I do. Of course, all of my clients are successful and more successful having worked with me. The point is we have to focus less on the business, less on sales, because the relationship is actually what moves commerce far greater than going to Harvard Business School or being wow. smarter than the next person. 
That's so good. You know, it's the old adage, right? You do business with people that you know, like, and trust. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, this and, is and that's what we're constantly have. trying to do. Absolutely. Yeah. That's such a gift. Wow. You, you, you talk a lot about leveraging the personal brand of a business owner, a business leader. That, that's, that's interesting. And I don't hear a ton of discussion around that. I'd love to hear more about that, about why you think that is so important and how businesses need to be thinking strategically and intentionally about this. Yeah, absolutely. I, I wouldn't say it's important. I would say it's absolutely vital, right? Nice. It is not the traditional way of thinking about marketing. It's not yeah. the traditional way of thinking about commerce, yeah. right? The old philosophy is let's focus on the company. Let's focus mm -hmm. on, let's say, the T-Mobiles of the world. Let's focus on the product we're offering. But I would argue it's actually more important to focus on the thought leaders, the specialists who are running the company. Why? Because any company is lifeless. It is a corporate entity yeah. with no true heartbeat. The heartbeat is defined by the C-suite, the leaders, the executives who are yeah. powering the ethics, morals, and values that trickle down and permeate every single aspect of the company. Again, whether you are a solo run entrepreneur run business or Again, if you're a Fortune 100 company, my job and my unique vantage point, which is highly effective, is to focus on those leaders. What do they do? What are their values outside of business? Because again, if I can know, like, and trust this business leader, I'm yeah. much more likely to have an invested stake in the company they're currently pushing. But most importantly, the company is they will continue to represent the remainder of their career. That's really powerful, Tyler. I think I think that what you're describing too is the importance of culture. You know, a company's culture comes from the leaders. Like that's something you can't delegate as a leader. You cannot delegate the creation and and the maintenance of a culture. And what you're describing is being so intentional about that culture because the best content, the best products come out of the best cultures. Absolutely. And, and, you know, culture is oftentimes uh, an overused word in yeah. corporate America. A lot of times, or I should say historically, culture refers to summer Fridays, getting off early in the summer on Fridays. It's beanbag chairs and cold brew on tap, right? Which is like, <laughs> great. I'm all for that. I give my team summer Fridays. We don't have brick and mortar, but like, go get your cold brew. Like, I, 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 I don't care about any of that. You know, what is most important is the team trusting the leader, understanding yes. who the leader is, but most importantly, humanizing the leader. If you act like a human with your team, they will respect you more, they will trust mm -hmm. you more, and they will be more willing to work and more willing to show up for the clients, even though other than their paycheck, they don't really have an invested stake in their company, nor should they. You know, that's, that's an interesting spin on something that I talk about. I talk about the importance of a leader treating their team members as actual 3D human beings, not as cogs in the machine with what they're trying to build. And when you do that, people tend to lean in when they feel like they're being treated as a human. You're talking about the leader behaving as a human. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's, that's so important. That's the other side of that coin. And I think it's a both hand. Mm -hmm. Look, I, I always, always operate, obviously, within the confines of appropriate professional rapport, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we have an uh, employee handbook. We have all of those things that, that are necessary to run a professional and safe environment for my team. But I'll also stress that I have no problem, you know, within appropriate measures, sharing aspects of my personal life, yeah. aspects of things that I'm going through, aspects of the business that most, you know, employers would never share. Yeah. You know, I, I, and this isn't to pat me on the back, but I, through negative experience with certain, you know, previous employers, I have learned how I don't want to run an organization. Mm -hmm. And you know, when we have as a startup previously, like let's say year one, been like, okay, what do we need to do to clear payroll this week or yeah. this month? 
instead of saying, okay, team, we're taking pay cuts, I go, no, 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 I'm just not taking a paycheck this week. And that's not to pat me on the back. I'm not saying that's even necessary or required and all business owners should do that. But by showing up and saying, look, I would never ask anyone on my team to take a, let's say, break or a blow that I'm not willing to take, I think speaks volumes. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, I rarely make a business decision without enlisting the help of the team members that that would affect, which I find is wildly uncommon. If I'm thinking about having to reorganize or move people around or God forbid, lay someone off, I'm always having a conversation with all parties affected mm -hmm. so that I can make an informed decision. We're building out, you know, certain aspects of the business right now. And this isn't a, a unilateral dictator, you know, dictator decision. I would never be able to grow these aspects of the business without my art direction team having say. So not only do I let them have say, I let them tell me what they want to do and I approve their thought process, right? So that's really how we approach culture here, because if I give them a say and an invested stake in the organization, even if that's not contractually mandated through equity, I can still make them feel like the valued employee or staff member that they truly are. By giving them ownership over parts of the business, that is how I retain employees and make them feel valued because frankly, they are, and I don't have a company without them. Unlike other companies that I've worked at, I understand that. And that's how I try to lead through example. I hope everybody who is listening to this will rewind that and write that down and begin to implement that in their business. Because Tyler, what you just described is taking to a different level the idea of treating people as 3D human beings, treating them as actual people who have hopes and dreams of their own and helping them understand that they are valued. When people feel valued, they stick. This is my experience. Absolutely. And that's what you're creating. I mean, major kudos on that because so many people miss this. You're also keying in on something else, which is, hey, I hired these people to do something. They have a specialty and a skill. Why would I not let them do it? <laughs> Why do I have it to make all the decisions? It makes no sense. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I can't tell you how many times I've been in a position, you've been in a position. So many people listening have been in a position where I'm hired to do something and they're like, no, 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 no. We're not going to listen. We're not going to do that. And I'm like, fine, the check's clearing. But like, why did you call me then? Yeah. The same thing with all of my staff members. If I could, let's say, run an art department and design websites better than the people I hired to do it, why did I hire them? I can make a lot more money doing it alone. Yeah. And so, And so that's what I think is interesting. I really, even from a contractual standpoint, in my team's employees and, and staff agreements, we have have unlimited PTO. And, you know, that's common and, and in today's world in terms of culture, but I'm like, please go take it. What are we doing? Like, mm -hmm. yes, they have mandated holiday schedules, but I'm like, guys, we've worked really hard this year. Take Christmas to New Year's off. And then beyond that, from a financial perspective, because I, I find that a lot of companies today say, oh, unlimited PTO, um, which is positive culture, but we know statistically people take off less when they have unlimited PTO. Right. So it's really disguised as a, a term to increase culture while also increasing productivity. What I focus on is the contractual and financial aspects because mm. yes, everyone in business responds to different, um, you know, um, I'll say, you know, you've heard about love languages and relationships. There yeah. are the love languages of business, which is basically the same thing minus physical touch. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, which is a good absolutely. thing. That's a so, good answer. So, so ultimately there are some people, you know, like, you know, for example, my managing director, we all love money, but she certainly values praise, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, you know, I certainly value money. So it's like, how can I both feel wanted and, and, and value money? And that's what I would find most people say to me. They're like, I don't want a pizza party. I want cash. And I go, be my guest. So if you even look at our employee agreements, my business lawyer is like, are you insane? Because our business agreements state 
a mandated raise. I have no problem mandating certain thresholds and mandated raises for my team. If we are profitable to this threshold or this threshold or this threshold, I not only want to, but I'm contractually mandated to give you a certain percentage raise, right? If, for example, you know, we have profit share for our senior leadership, which I've been told never to do. Wow. We have um, equity um, jurisdiction for my senior leaders, which I've been told to never do. Um, and I say, I understand how a business owner could be shy about doing those things, but ultimately I don't have a business without the people who are leading it. So that's how I run my business, both from a culture standpoint and a contractual standpoint. I love how you have built intentional ways to value people in ways that they best receive that. Yeah. You know, you talk about the love languages. This is, this is great language to use here because so often we will try to value other people in the way that we want to feel valued. That may or may not be the best way for them. And Absolutely. I love that you're keyed into that. You're tuned into that so that you can show them appreciation and value in the way that they best receive it. Absolutely. And even on intake, when I, when I ask people and I meet them for the first time, once they've been hired, you know, I ask them that question, you know, we go through a similar test, like you would, if you were taking the love language test in your relationship and there's no right answer. I just really need to know if me praising you in front of a group of people is more rewarding than me privately giving you a raise. And it's funny because there are really visceral reactions surrounding this. A lot of people are like, why would I ever want to be praised publicly versus getting a bonus? And I will tell you, there are people who would prefer that. Yeah. And let me be clear. I'm never like, let's clap for this employee and I'm not going to pay them more. <laughs> but it's important to note, yeah. right? That, yeah, that yeah. that's something we're looking through. And, and you know, the, the contractual aspect is just a baseline. You know, mm -hmm. I will tell you that, and, and, you know, I'm telling all of my staff this this week so I can gladly share with you, but it's like, I'm exceeding their contractual minimum in terms of what they are contractually due in terms of raise and bonus this year, exclusively because I think that's the right thing to do. I'm foregoing my bonus, not for a pat on my back, but because they've worked very, very, very hard and I wouldn't have a salary, much less a bonus without them. So that's how I try to run my business. Do I fall short many times? Yes. Have I made many mistakes in business leading? Absolutely. Will I continue to do that? Yes. But at the end of the day, I truly believe you learn from your mistakes. And if your heart is in the right place and truly in the right place and you back it up with action, that's what moves the needle and retains star talent. And Tyler, it sounds like exactly what you're doing. I'm desperately trying. So <laughs> I have a boat of confidence. I'd love to hear about Henry Street Creative. I'd love to hear some of the stories of people that you've worked with. They have almost a thousand clients so far, and you're not done. Like, what are some of the what are some of the wins that you have seen happen? Yeah, I mean, I would say the overwhelming majority, ninety eight percent of our previous roster has experienced incredible wins. That two percent accounts for people getting out of the business. People we just weren't good, you know um uh relationship fits with right which is inevitable when you're working with this quantity yeah. you know and what i will say is henry street creative was was really created out of a need in the market i found i really specialize in business consultancy so i work one on one with a lot of fantastic business leaders again people who are starting today in business people who have done this for 50 years and want to understand how to do it better and what I found is that I had very little control outside of the business consultancy wor world in ensuring the deliverables that I needed for my clients to be successful, to be delivered in a positive manner. Meaning mm -hmm. I would work with you and I would say, okay, for example, um, I, I need you to have a personal website. Mm -hmm. Okay, bye, go and uh, figure that out versus... I have an in-house resource that I can oversee. I can ensure the product and will go through me to ensure it's adhering to best practice. And get this, I'll charge you at cost. So ultimately, Henry Street Creative is a secondary byproduct of my business consultancy. All of my hmm. clients have the ability to, not the requirement to, but the ability to go through our in-house agency to get these top tier first class assets created better than our competitors at a rate that's oftentimes 50% on the dollar. Why? Because I'm not charging the overhead that our competitors are and rightfully so need to charge in order to stay alive. 
because I'm obviously obviously sharing the staff members who are working on these projects are compensated very well for their time. I don't have to charge an additional, um, I'll say a traditional agency markup like my competitors do. And that makes me incredibly competitive while giving top tier assets and being able to control it. I got to tell you, I've been in this space for a minute and I have never heard of a model like what you just described. It is wildly unheard of. Most sales and business coaches would tell me that I'm crazy, but my business consultancy model funds the entire agency because I retain my clients. I keep them because I provide them such value that they don't leave. I'll be honest, wow. to date, I have never in my private client roster ever had a client leave. And will that change? Yes. I, I know it will change. It is inevitable. Um, I have obviously consulted for third parties and some of their clients have left. But outside of that, uh, my private roster traditionally hasn't left and doesn't leave because of the results they're seeing. And, you know, I charge a premium for that. But at the same time, I'm ROI focused. My job is to make you a lot more money than yeah. you're ever paying me in marketing. And that's why I try to keep costs as low as possible because that ROI is the most important aspect when clients consider if they're going to stay or not. So yeah, I've worked on the agency side. Yes, I've paid millions of dollars monthly to agencies and I found that they were broken. And I set out to say, how can I truly reinvent the agency model? And I think we've done just that. Remarkable. You know, I've, I've been, as an executive coach, I've been coaching leaders for almost 30 years now leading teams and organizations, various sizes, various types. And I have never once had a client say, this was a waste of my time. And that's my, that's my gold standard. You're going to have clients come and go, that, that's part of it. And, and that's great. I mean, I, I launch them and say, hey, do awesome things now. But I've never had one say it was a waste of time. And I think that's the value that you're bringing. You're bringing the value where people are like, not only is this not a waste of my time, I'm going to invest in this in such a way that it enables everything else that you're doing. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I work with leaders in many industries. I'll say I'm fortunate enough to have worked in most all industries, um, in most major industries. I'm not saying every you know position on earth I've worked in, but yeah. you know the, the major ones you could name off the top of your head, I've been fortunate enough to work with leaders in those in those markets. What I will tell you is a large, large area of my specialty is entrepreneurship, individual salespeople. So that's yes. insurance salespeople, mortgage lenders. And I do a lot of real estate work. Mm. And, you know, what I find is the way I price my model is you on average have to sell one additional house per year based on our work together to recoup a hundred percent of your investment and make a hundred percent profit. Wow. And, and that's not an exaggeration. The average home price in the major markets I'm working in sits between 800 to a million dollars. That's anywhere from 24 to $30,000 in traditional revenue. Uh, I'm charging half of that. If you could sell one additional home and let me be clear, you would be the first one in my roster not to do it. Yeah. Um, you've recouped that and made a hundred percent back on your money. And I've been paid well in order to help you along that way. So I find it as a win-win scenario for both client and me. And that's why I get out of bed in the morning because I love doing what I do. And obviously you're quite good at it. <laughs> I try to be. I'll let you be the test of that. And I'll let my <laughs> my my clients be the test of that. But, you know, certainly I, I would say the numbers um, lead to that conclusion. I want to talk for just a minute about marketing strategy. This is this is an area that you excel. And as an expert in this field, you know, there's a lot of discussion around content and what role content should play in your overall strategy for marketing. What would you what would you say to that idea? Like how important is content? Well, look, content is one of the most important things in your personal and corporate marketing strategy. Because you know, you've know you obviously heard a million times that a photo is worth a thousand words. Well, a video and content strategy and repeated content is worth a thousand photos. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately it's the easiest way we can get consumers to know, like, and trust you. Yeah. If I know you as a human, not just a salesperson, not just as the CEO of this company, and I actually understand, oh, maybe you have a family, here's your interest, here's where you're vacationing. If I can 
really identify with you in many different ways. Even if I don't make the amount of money you make, maybe I don't own a company, maybe I'm a teacher in small town, Texas, but I still understand you and I have general lease the same interest. That's what humanizes you. You know, mm -hmm. this person's very polarizing, but someone like Taylor Swift has mastered the art of relatability. Yes, she's a pop star. Yes, she is arguably the most successful pop star ever. She's one of the first billionaire pop stars. And I will tell you, it's for many reasons. Is she a good songwriter? Certainly. Is she great at what she does? Yes. Is she a great businesswoman? Certainly. But one of her biggest superpowers is being relatable to the masses. Yes. She is the person who has her cat and is a dork and a nerd. And whether you like her music or don't like her music, I don't care. The reality is she really, whether it's intentional or not, looks like the every woman. And that is what's really, really important here. So content and content strategy that ladders up into that and not just into, I'm a hustler and watch me be a yeah. business person, right. really humanizes her. And that's why content is so important. And obviously with all of my clients, we work deeply in content strategy, not just ethereally, but this is how we produce content. This is how we set a process. And this is how we should be thinking about content. And then the step beyond is send me your content and let me approve it. Let me workshop it to get it to a place that is going to be engageable, but most importantly, repeatable. How do you, how do you ensure in that process that the content is going to resonate with the people that you wanted to resonate with? Well, the unfortunate reality is content strategy is not a science. It is half science and half pseudoscience. It's based on an algorithm we don't have complete insight into. It's based on consumer preference that we don't really have that much insight into. But what I can tell you is if we start with best practice, we're going to be set up for success nine times out of 10. And so ultimately that is where I approach. The secondary part, which is I would argue the most important part is approaching content authentically. Mm -hmm. What I hate hearing all the time is, oh, this is what I should do. Well, a real estate oh, agent should yeah. do this. This yeah. is how so-and-so should behave. And that's a misnomer. Yeah. Maybe someone you followed acted that way because they thought they should, or maybe that's who they authentically are. Mm -hmm. If you are an eccentric, a reverent real estate agent, tech CEO, Fortune 100 CEO, and that's who you are at your core, I desperately want to see that because that humanizes you. It's going to make you more relatable. You think about the John Ledgers of the world. You think about the Ryan Serhants of the world, all people I represent or have represented, and nothing about them is standard. Nothing about them is traditional in the realm of corporate America. And it's ironically what made them some of the most successful business people on earth. Mm -hmm. My job is to harness your authentic truth and show that through content and empower you in order to do so. So good. So if I'm a, if I'm a business owner, business leader, and I want to improve my content strategy, what is one step or one thing that they can do today? Yeah. So I'm all about action items. I'm not about this ethereal hippy dippy mumbo jumbo that you hear about at all of these marketing conferences about like harnessing your inner warrior and like praying to a turtle in Ethiopia, right? The power of execution is key. And that's what I focus on. So the first thing I see in terms of content strategy, and this is something that comes directly from my colleague and client, Ryan Serhant and his training program we really focus on dividing content into three major pillars. That first pillar is professional content. If you're a real estate agent, if you're an entrepreneur, this is me at work, working on my business, whatever that might be. The secondary category is personal. I want to see you outside of your business, period, mm -hmm. full stop. I want to see your family, your travel, your hobbies, your aspirations. Where are you eating? Where are you working out? What do you like to do? Do you love Broadway? Do you love music? Do you love horses? Like, I don't care what it is. I want to see that aspect of your life because it makes mm -hmm. you real. And then the third thing is what we call your differentiator, right? Mm -hmm. right? Sir Hand calls it your and. This idea of what separates you from other people doing what you do. You mm -hmm. know, I use this example in real estate all the time. Your ability to write a contract doesn't make you special. You know, uh, high schoolers who are 18 with an IQ of four can write a contract in real estate. 
Like the amount of people I have seen in real estate that maybe shouldn't be is unprecedented. The same thing with any industry. There are a million tech CEOs. There are a million tech startups. There are a million mortgage lenders and insurance salespeople, you name it, right? What makes you as a human being, not your products, your humanness, different. And so that's what we focus on. For me, it's like mentorship. And I love Broadway. Sue me, right? Previously, I would have been really hesitant to share that because what if people think this is a side hustle? What if people think I like Broadway more? No, I've made so many connections by that love. And it obviously doesn't define me, but it helps me in content strategy. So I would say first, really focus on a consistent strategy that will allow you to post three to five times a week in all of those categories. You'll note that your professional life is only a third of your strategy. It is not even close to the majority of your strategy. Nothing mm -hmm. is. We really want to focus on a holistic, omni-channel approach to humanize you and take you to the next level. So good. So practical. And anybody can do that. Truthfully, it, it, it is so easy once you have guidance and yeah. oftentimes someone holding your hand and then pushing you off the cliff and, yeah. and helping you fly. How are you are leading at a significant level these days. And I would imagine that you have grown as a leader from where you were five years ago. Five years from now, your company is going to need you to lead at a different level yet. You're going to have to grow. How do you stay on top of your game? How do you level up with your leadership skills? You know, I level up with my leadership skills every day by working with the best leaders in the world. Mm -hmm. And I do that by learning how I don't want to lead. I yeah. do that by learning how they lead and how that works. I learn by seeing that at the end of the day, all of these people are human beings. They have wants, needs, fears. A lot of the times these leaders that oftentimes are household names yeah. have looked at me and been like, I have no idea what I'm doing, right? And I go, oh, that gives me such peace because yeah. I'm sitting here in my body, just like you're sitting there in your body, just like hundreds of people listening are sitting in their bodies, oftentimes with imposter syndrome, being like, who do I think I am to run a company or sell something and or, or whatever it might be? Again, by being on the inside and having unprecedented access to business leaders and then trying to share that with the world, I realize everyone here is human. And so... The more I grow, the more opportunity I get, the more experience I get, it really is an exponential growth pattern. You know, mm -hmm. my passion is obviously helping people and I can help more people the more people know about me. I can help more people the more stages I'm speaking on. I can help more people the more incredible opportunities I have, like today's opportunity speaking with you you know, being on national television, those things are important to me and ever more important to me as I grow, you know, my personal brand, because that allows me to help people. I always remind people, personal brand and self-promotion is not selfish unless you're doing it for selfish reasons. Yeah. Hospitals, nonprofits, they all advertise, not because they want to become billionaires. They do it because that's the best way they can tell people how they can help them. And that's what I do in my personal business. And that's what I help creators and entrepreneurs around the world do as well. Mm. Hard to serve people when they don't know who you are. Absolutely. <laughs> that's so good. You know, it's easy, I think, for somebody listening to this to listen to your story, your journey so far and say, man, Tyler's Tyler's journey's just been up and to the right. Like he hasn't he hadn't really faced any of the challenges that I face as as a as an entrepreneur. He hadn't really struggled like I struggle. Mm -hmm. Would you have anything to say to that? Oh, I, I mean, everyone in life is only showcasing their highlight reel, right? Yes. Um, and we're comparing our truth to someone else's highlight reel because we know all the truth inside. Yeah. You know, let, uh, what I didn't mention to you is like, let's talk about how I auditioned for eight months and I didn't get, you know, cast in anything as a professional actor. That was a huge failure. Let's talk about how I was fired from a Broadway contract um, mm -hmm. for reasons that are out of my control and I thought I would never work again. Let's talk mm -hmm. about never getting a pay raise at uh, a certain job that I had despite being incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about... Um, not making many raises that I had to as a producer on Broadway. Let's talk about being laid off 
from NBC. Let's talk about, you know, transitioning out of real estate development before I was ready to. Let's talk about not trans transitioning to the Biden-Harris campaign in the White House. Let's mm -hmm. talk about being negative my first year of business. Let's talk about being in the red my second year of business. All of those things happened. And all of those things are truthful. And all of those things, you know, you know, experienced, um, you it made me experience great pain and and fear of failure and feelings of inadequacy. I'm human, right? And everyone I work with is human. And I would be hard pressed to find anyone I've worked with who hasn't experienced that. And I'm wildly vocal about it. That doesn't make me weak. I think that makes me stronger because when a client comes to me and is like, Tyler, I'm in the red. I'm like, I don't care. Let's get you out of the red. We can't change you being in the red right now. We can change it tomorrow, right? And so let's work through that. So yeah, I'm here to talk about my highlight reel and how I help people, but I wouldn't be able to help people if I too haven't failed and failed epically in my life. And frankly, I'll fail again this year and I'll fail again next year. It's the people who say, well, I'm getting back on the treadmill today um, because this is my life's passion. So good. So transparent, so authentic, so real. Thank you for that. Of course, my pleasure. You know, I, I ask every guest this question. You know, you you are a continual learner. You've talked about how you learn from so many of the leaders that you're around. Is there a book that has made a big difference in your journey that you would recommend to other leaders? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I call it my Bible. Um, it is called You Are a Badass. It is now, you know, a very common self-help book um, written by an incredible author named Jen Sincero. Um, and it was the first book I read that I was like, mm, she gets me. Mm. I get it. I'm done complaining. I am now going to manifest my own existence. Mm. And am I successful at doing that a hundred percent of the time? Yes. And do you know what's wild? My friends and my colleagues will tell you, Tyler is a crazy manifester because I have this wild sense of confidence that has cyclically improved by me being able to manifest things, right? I truly believe if you have a positive attitude and a positive energy and you surround yourself and you do the work, this doesn't just magically happen. I don't meditate in the morning and then go to sleep. I wish, but ultimately it really changed my life. And as someone who has been fortunate enough to work with many celebrities and household names, I'll tell you, I, I don't get starstruck. And that's a huge advantage of mine. These people are people. Yeah. I don't yeah, care who you are. Right. I'll tell you if I disagree with you, but there are two people on earth that I would lose my ever living mind to meet. One is Oprah Winfrey. If you have connections, William, please let me know. Um, and number two is Jen Sincero because she had mm -hmm. such a profound impact in my life um, that um, I would just love to meet her one day and tell her about that um, because I truthfully, truthfully, truthfully believe that in addition to sure my hard work and dedication, her book won me my Tonys. Her book got me my career. Her book built the house I'm living in. The book wow. bought my upstate house. All of those things I have today are sure a byproduct of my work, but also a byproduct of this book, You Are a Badass. And I will tell you secretly, you know, everyone has, after they've had one too many cocktails at a client party, they have their tell. My tell is buying this book for anyone I speak to. Like I was at Madison Square Garden and I purchased it for everyone behind the concession line. You know what I mean? Like that's how much I love this book. So if you're listening, you want to change your life, it's nine bucks. If you don't have the nine bucks, email me all, all kidding aside and I'll send it to your house because it's that game changing. Amazing. Tyler, you know, often people are going to leave an episode like this with one big idea, one big takeaway. If you could define that, what would you want that to be? Yeah, I, I have a really clear answer for you. You know, I always go back and forth here. It's either to live life authentically and not care what others think, because no matter what you do, no matter who you are, you will always have dissent. You know, I always yes. give this example. There are people who hate working with women. There are hate people who hate working with men. There are people who hate Democrats, Republican, pro-life, pro-choice, energetic, too calm. You name it. Whatever yes. it is, there will be a group of people who don't want to work with you because of that. That's so right. why try to be something you're not when you're still going to ostracize people for being that fake creation? Instead, focus on yourself and, and that authentic truth. And that really changed my life. The other thing that I live my life through and my business through is the idea that lighting someone else's candle does not extinguish your own. Yes. The idea that me helping someone for free, 
not wanting anything else in return and knowing I will get nothing in return just because it's oftentimes the right thing to do mm -hmm. has changed my life and changed my business. And I have a really strong methodology in how I do that to every single person I meet. Wow. Alan, oh, this has been such an amazing conversation. So much value that you have added to me and I know to so many of our listeners. Thank you for that. I, I so appreciate you having me. I know people are going to want to stay connected with you and continue to learn from you and about you. What is the best way for them to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking. You know, speaking on this philosophy of lighting other people's candle, you know, I said I have a strong methodology that leans into this, and that's what I want to share with everyone listening. If you want to learn more about me and my business consultancy and how I change the lives of Fortune 100 CEOs and, you know, new entrepreneurs, visit tylergmounts.com. There you can book, truthfully, a 30-minute free consult with me. This is not a sales call. You won't get additional sales pitches from me. I truthfully want to sit. I want to hear about your business. I want to hear what's not working, and I want to point you in the right direction. Because if me spending 30 minutes with you changes your life, it's 30 minutes well spent. So ultimately, visit tylergmount.com. Find out a little bit more about me, what we're doing. Um, and then obviously, if you're interested in any of those creative services, video production, website, logo, anything that you need to brand yourself and your personal brand online, you can obviously visit our agency website, which is henrystreetcreative.com. Tyler, I can't wait to see what your next chapters look like. <laughs> I, I can't too. Let's just hope they continue to get better. That's the goal, right? For all of us. Thanks for listening to Catalytic Leadership with Dr. William Attaway. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss the next episode. Want more? Go to catalyticleadership.net.